Hi, everyone. Thank you again for being for this next episode with someone who I really admire, uh, a brother who I came like a year ago. I saw his videos. He's been zealous for the Lord. Uh, if he, for instance, I saw his uh, video he done with J Dr. Jacob Persley, someone who also did a podcast with. And the last couple of weeks, the, the Lord has put it on my heart to do a podcast with him. And I know that he even better than me knows and understands the Armenians because we are Armenians ourselves, but you also try to understand what it is, what it means to be Christian. And we have come here to get it in order for Armenians to reconcile the culture that they inherited from, from the Bible and from the churches and why it is that the churches are so significant for our culture. And Instead of being nominal Christians by name, we want to be born again Christians. And we're going to handle a certain type of uh, topics. But Brother Arthur Azadrin, welcome to the podcast. You're someone uh, when you frame. Uh... Oh, there you are again. There was a moment that you froze. But anyway, okay. My brother, there are many things that you have actually already done. But can you could you please tell us? What type of activities that are that you are involved in, if it comes to apologia? Oh, that's complicated. Uh, but that's that's fine. Thanks for having me on. It's it's a pleasure, and it's always uh, good connecting with Armenians um, who are doing this sort of work um, around the world. Uh, because I think God has called our people uh, to to truly be uh, a light in the world. I, I think that's uh, extremely important. I think that's a general call for Christians, and maybe sometimes I'm convinced it might be a, a bit more of a specific call for Armenians. Uh, there is a reason, I would say, why Ar Armenia has survived, kind of, um, it, it, it doesn't make logical sense, uh, considering all the wars, considering all the empires we've been surrounded by, and kind of the struggle to exist, and we're still here. I mean, we, we need to be very careful not to ignore the fact that God's providence and his sovereignty rules over all of creation and all of history. So uh, thanks for having me on. And it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, I was living in Armenia. I lived in Armenia for a year and a half. Um, just got back about a year ago, September will be a year with my family. And we started a organization in Armenia called Apologia Center, which is what my YouTube channel is called. And that's essentially to equip the church in Armenia in apologetics given reasons, thought out reasons for the existence of God. Um, what I like about apologetics is that it's cross-denominational. Okay, now, I have my personal opinions and beliefs um, about those secondary issues that Christians uh, disagree on. Uh, but when it comes to the work of apologetics, that stuff essentially for me is put to the side because we talk about what C.S. Lewis would call what we call mere Christianity, right? What are those things that if you were to disagree on, you can no longer be considered a Christian? That's kind of where my heart is, is because uh, I think predominantly, I just want people to come to know Jesus. So apologetics is always um, connected with evangelism. And you can't separate those things. I want people to come to know Jesus and apologetics is a tool for some people to come to know Jesus. Um, and then once they become Christians, then we can have those conversations about the secondary issues, but let's have them become Christians first. <laughs> let's have them. And by becoming Christians, by becoming Christians, I mean to say, giving their life to Jesus and following after him. It's, it's very simple. I don't want to complicate it. Jesus went to people and told them, come follow after me. That call is still true today. Jesus is still calling people to follow after him. And, uh, you know, Jesus says, if you love me, you obey me. You obey my commands. Uh, if you obey my commands, that means you love me. That's what Jesus is about. And um, so I want to be about that. Uh, I have my YouTube channel, my internet kind of stuff that I do. Uh, we work with people to translate things into Armenian. Um, some of those take a lot longer because you got to get rights. You got to get approval. You got to get the funding. Um, so that's both with my organization and then with other folks as well. So I'm kind of, and I serve in my local church. I'm an elder in my local church. Um, and so I teach predominantly in my local church. It's an Armenian church, 
that is done in English. Uh, we do have a completely uh, full Armenian service as well, but um, our congregation, because people don't read and write maybe Armenian as well as uh, English, we have everything in English. And we, are, we are, yeah. Hey, we're, a lot of us are in the same boat. A lot of us are in the same boat, right? Like I read Armenian extremely slowly. Yeah. Uh, but, you know what it happens. You know every when time, I think about when I, when when I scroll through a, a Facebook feed, for instance, and I see like an Armenian post, there's a side of me that thinks like, why don't I write it in English? And there's a side of me who says like, it's good that I've done this because I need to learn Armenian. So there's like this dichotomy inside of me that just doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because language has been a preserving factor for us as Armenians. But I also think about, you know, why our, our Armenian was developed, right? Like Mesrop Mashtot, why, why develop it? Well, it's predominantly to translate the Bible. It wasn't for necessarily a cultural identity. Like, here's what we are and we're connected with our thing. It was to understand God. It was to know God. I always tell people, you know, before Luther was doing this whole like translating stuff into Ger uh, into the common man's language into German, you know, Armenians are do doing this in the fifth century. Like we, we had people and mm -hmm. which tells you, by the way, something about God. When you see different cultures, different Christians in different cultures working extremely hard to get what God has communicated with us into the language of that people. What that tells me about God is that God inspired these people to do this. And God actually wants us to understand him in the best language that we understand. Okay. Now, if for me, the best language to understand is English, or if it's Mandarin, if it was, it's ancient Armenian, right? If it's Mesopotamian Armenian, if it's Greek, then I think God would want me to use that kind of a language. I'm not saying we shouldn't speak Armenian and read and write. And I, I, I teach my children Armenian. I speak to them in Armenian. But I also realize living outside of Armenia, there's it brings about all sorts of challenges. Listen, listen living in Armenia brings its sorts of challenges, right? Uh, where Russian was the dominant language for for the last whatever many years, it still is to a certain extent. Uh, so language for me is a tool. And culture employs language, that, but that it, it goes way beyond language. There's a lot more involved in it than just language. Uh, just as so, yeah, that's mentioned, some of the stuff I'm involved in and uh, continue to be involved in. Just as you already mentioned, it's not only cross-denomination, it's also international. So there is this particular part where um, uh, there's like the individual, there's like the group, and there's like the international community in and of itself. And that's the language that the Lord, that the God itself is speaking in the vernacular, whatever language it is that you speak. And God would not be God if you not understand the language that you speak. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Christianity is not like Islam. You don't have to learn a specific <laughs> language. That's the subject um, apart. <laughs> anyway. You know, like uh, <laughs> God will communicate you in the language that you best understand. Yeah. Coming, uh, coming to it. Um, many, many Armenians to this day know that uh, Armenia was once part of the Soviet Union, and mm -hmm. we somewhat know about communism. But what type of effect does communism had uh, on Armenia, and especially on the, on the Christian side of the Armenian spectrum? And on mm -hmm. a global level, what the type of dangers does co communism or Marxism take with it what could you say about that well um let me start here because uh, i'm not a historian or you know whatever all those things this is going to come from my personal studies and kind of understandings communism specifically and you can say marxism uh, marxism is going to i think naturally lead to socialism that leads to communism right? i think that's a continuous trend um and it is not just a political system some people might not like what I'm about to say, uh, but it is a pseudo-theological system. Okay, it's a fake theological system. Um, even though, you know, the other oh, communism had atheism involved in it and all that stuff. Um, it's, it, it's this, this is what's wrong with it, theologically. That there could be some kind of a peaceful brotherhood of believers 
uh, sorry, of believers in communism, peace for brotherhood of humanity uh, that gets rid of all kind of distinctions, class distinctions. So what does this assume? One of them is assumes that human beings actually have this ability and capability uh, to do this, where the Bible says humanity is sinful naturally. We're rebellious against God, so we're naturally going to have division. So when I look at humanity, I'm expecting there to be evil because, hum because Scripture says human beings are not good naturally. I think when the communist ideology, the Marxist ideology, has a different view of humanity, okay, and that clashes theologically or the lack of theology, however you want to look at this. I don't think any Christian can be a true Marxist because it's the, creating this utopia, creating this heaven on earth, it flies straight in the face of what Christian uh, ideology is. So it doesn't surprise me that most people who are Marxist communists uh, are, are not Christians, right? Are, or, or they claim Christianity in a very general sense, but they've redefined what it actually is. They, they, their theology isn't biblical. Um, so Armenia was under communist rule for give or take let's say 70 years and what has that that done in armenia my personal observation would be one of them that it's created a a population that relies too heavily on the government still till this day if you're in armenia i had I had uh, multiple conversations. Taxi drivers are some of the best people you can have conversations with in Armenia. I agree. <laughs> uh, because they're willing to have the conversation. And, and they have lots of conversations. And they have something to say. And regularly, I would have uh, individuals uh, complain why the, you know, the government's not doing this and that. And sometimes I ask these individuals, why are you expecting the government to do that? And they would kind of look at me. You know, like, what's wrong with you? I mean, it's the government's job. And I would say, no, I would say, it's not the government's job. It's the individual's job as a individual citizen. And it was very strange for me to come at that. Now, I'm, I'm an American conservative. Um, and that means I believe in extremely small federal government. Um, and um, I'm a constitutionalist, I would say. So my American kind of, right? political philosophy would come through in these conversations. And I would realize people aren't understanding it. And I would say that's a result of communism. It, communism creates a lazy populace. Yeah. Okay. It makes you reliant on the state. And it, re, it makes you reliant on the state in ways that you shouldn't be reliant on the state. I think there's ways we ought to be reliant on the state. It's the responsibility of the state, for example, to protect its populace, to create freedoms for people to flourish and yeah. all these things. But don't be the overarching baby mama, for instance. Like, I got, a, I got a quick short story. Like, two years ago, I went to Armenia. And within the first two days, I wanted to go to Yerevan, to the main capital. And there, this taxi driver just... Like, I just already felt in my spirit, like, this guy is, I hope never, no one gets into it, uh, the taxi with him. But the one thing that he said just, like, struck a nerve with me is that he said when uh, when all the prices in Armenia, I just asked him, uh, ever since the Velvet Revolution of Nikol Pashinyan, how has Armenia has been changed? It's just very interesting how internally the, the people in and of itself were thinking. And he told me, when all the prices in Armenia, Armenia go down, and the toshak, which means the welfare, goes up. We will live like this. And I don't want to be mean-spirited. I just wanted to smack his face, lovingly said. But that's really the attitude. So, yeah, yeah it's and, he uh, heavily on the government. Heavily, heavily on the government. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it makes sense for the government to have some kind of a safety net for people that can provide for themselves. I think that's a good model. But... Again, how much, right? How much of a safety net? How, how much do we rely on the government to baby us, to care for us, take care of us? The other thing is that where is the government getting its finances from? It has to be getting it from somewhere. It's getting it from its populace, uh, which would result in heavy taxation. If you want to have heavy, if you want to have high stuff like that, the government providing, say, all of your needs, you're going to have to tax your population, which for me ends up, again, it doesn't create motivation. It doesn't create innovation. 
um, I, yeah, I don't want to go into the political philosophy. I think it's created laziness in Armenia. Um, the church, the Armenian church had been infiltrated by KGB agents. Now this yeah. is, I don't have specifically like sources to give people, you know, um, but this is something that I regularly heard and hear from Armenians that KGB agents were specifically put in the priesthood of the Armenian Apostolic Church and they would discourage folks or they would give them misinformation, um, uh, which has impacted the church. My parents went to Armenia uh, from Iran in 1984. Um, I, I was born in 1985. My older brothers were uh, about 11 and five, six years old when they went uh, to Armenia. One of the issues that they saw was, and now notice they're going from the Islamic Republic of Iran <laughs> under the Ayatollah, by the way, uh, Khomeini. Mm. Khomeini, to Armenia under communism. And so it was school, you know, school time. My brothers went to school and they had crosses hanging from their necks because even in Iran, they were Armenian Christians and they wore crosses. And the principal was standing in front of the school, checking to see who was wearing a cross and who was not. And they ripped the crosses off of my brother's necks. And, and then immediately put my brothers in indoctrination camps, communist indoctrination camps. Wait, in Armenia? 1985, 1986. That just boggles me. So again, when people talk about Armenia and Christianity and stuff, and I say, well, here's what communism did, yeah. right? Um, it, it This is the sort of stuff where you're an 11 year old who's again, coming from an Islamic country where no Muslim came up to you and ripped a cross off your neck. It, you were allowed to live in relative peace, right? Considering things. Now Iran's a unique case of things com uh, compared to other places, but and they go to Armenia. It's like our motherland. We're Christians and all this stuff. And then you got an Armenian communist principal standing in front of the school, making sure that the kids don't have um, crosses on them. They don't have religious kind of stuff. They're not talking about God. Uh, and they, they would say all, the, all, all sorts of stuff like this, you know, telling people, telling children, hey, why don't you pray to God and ask him to provide food for you? Um, and then, uh, you know, the kids praying and nothing happening. And then I'm saying, well, uh, why don't you ask Lenin? Um, and then and then the teacher providing a piece of bread for the kid. I mean, if this is not religious, I don't know what is. For those who haven't heard, and I, I do this regularly, I go back and listen to this. Uh, go listen to the Soviet Armenian anthem. And see the things it says about Armenians and then see the things it says about Lenin. It venerates Lenin. It pushes Lenin up into a it, into this idolatry place, where oh, you rescued us, Lenin. You know the Velvet. Uh, sorry, not the Velvet. The the October Revolution rescued us, and um, that's that's theology right there. I look at that and I go, well, hang on here. It refers to Armenians as a people who build with their hands and are constructive and stuff like that. You know, and I'm looking. At it, it's like okay, yeah, it, I get it. I get the fact that. Uh, communism would look at Armenians as this individuals who can create with their hands, but that's about it. That's your place. That's, you know, you're, that's your, you're the cog in the machine and that's your task to do in order for this brotherhood of uh, humanity to function and flourish well. And so it's anti, anti Bible, anti Christian, and it's, it's effects will still be seen in my opinion for another generation or two. Yeah. Um, I think so. Like if I'm looking at in Armenia, depending who I'm talking to, but folks in their 20s aren't affected by this kind of thinking. Folks in their 30s aren't really affected. But those who are closer to 40 and up yeah. are still under this kind of a mindset. 100%. Um, yeah. and, and that needs to be cleansed out. Um, in in, in a spiritual life. way. <laughs> yeah 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 absolutely yeah I, when i you know yeah. cleansed out i mean our minds need to be renewed we yeah. need to we need to get rid of bad ideology and ba bad thinking and bring in good thinking yeah um and for me good thinking first and foremost is biblical thinking okay mm -hmm. it's christian thinking 
And then added on to that, we can have all sorts of philosophical notions and ideas that get developed. And if they're, if those philosophical ideas and notions are developed and supported by scripture, even, uh, you know, even better. Because the thing that really surprised me as, as I got much older is that the people of my generation, for instance, who have like access to internet, have like access to a whole plethora of Bibles and all that type of stuff. Also dumb stuff. You have like new age stuff, atheist stuff, all type of stuff, but at least you have the access to it. But I do sense that uh, like when you have like a forest and all the trees are cut off, you got a little seeds are growing back up again. So like they know that th this cross that we're wearing has this particular significance and uh, the young generation is reviving a certain type of sense. But I do sense that the older generation, like 40 plus, 50 plus, that's like this taboo stuff. It's like they wear the crosses, but they say it's like, oh, it's, it's fantasy stuff. And that's the thing that bothers me. Like, I don't want to, to like get, put myself on the high horse and like, I know what it means to be a Christian. God forbid to, forever to let that type of fight enter me. But I do know for a fact that I was once a nominal Christian. I proclaimed, yeah, I was a Christian. I go to the church. They have a mosque. I have Jesus. They have Muhammad. And that was about it. Like mm -hmm. a, a football club. But then all the way throughout my life, I had like my road to the Damascus type of story. And, um, and the significance of our churches, the significance of our history, the significance of Khorvira, the significance of Vartan Mamikonyan, all those type of figures, it just like it, it vibrated something inside of me. And uh, I don't think that the older generation or particularly the type of spirit just negates it. Let's say like, that negates the whole biblical stuff. Uh, that they actually know what is really going on. And I think that it's really that typical Armenian proud hubristic type of way of looking at things. Yeah. And that's the whole apologia thing is so crucial for that. Yeah. So in, in, I, when people would ask me, how is it coming into conversation with people in Armenia, people from the States would ask me this. And I would respond to them by saying, it's much easier in Armenia to talk to young people about God than it is to old people, which is the absolute reversal here in America. In America, older people tend to be more religious, younger people tend to be more secular, non, not religious. In Armenia, the older people who grew up under communism tend to be the ones who are irreligious, right? Like they, they don't want to talk about God. It's again, like you said, it's like a fantasy. And then the younger people are like, let's have these discussions. I love having conversations uh, with, say, an Armenian who's like, well, yeah, I'm, I identify as a Christian, but I don't really follow this stuff. Um, it was much easier for me to have that conversation than mm. someone, say, 56 years old. Fruitful who says, soil, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm a Christian. That's what we are. No more conversations. Like, they don't want to have the biblical conversations. And so it's there is a lot of room for very good ministry uh, amongst Armenians in Armenia. Yeah. And part of it yeah, has access to, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, the internet brings about all sorts of access and people are interacting with various folks. If um, atheism is on the rise in Armenia, if, if people don't think atheism is on the rise in Armenia, they don't have their ear to the No, I thought, like the two years ago that I went back to Armenia, I saw, I saw people walking around with uh, the sickle and the hammer of a sickle and the hammer of the uh, communist sign. Yeah. Uh, tattooed up, not necessarily something against tattoos so that indicates that they are atheists, for instance, but you really sense they're trying to be secular, trying to be more Western like. When you think to go back to your roots, the roots are trying to become like where you are right now. So, so here's odd. the other thing about the roots argument uh, that's very concerning to me is that some people say, let's go back to our roots, and paganism is on the rise in Armenia, like ancient Armenian paganism. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if, how much familiar you are with this, but there's Somewhat. individuals that are like yeah. committed to the ancient gods, yeah. yeah. And and so that's dangerous as well, because again, their argument is, well, before Christianity, we were something else. Let's go back to that. Um, and so it's not a conversation. I, I like the roots conversation quite a bit, but we need to have a truth conversation before the roots conversation, right? Like, Amen. was it true? Is what you're saying, is what you're believing true? If it is, then even more support in our ancestry that we have, some of the people you mentioned. Um, 
and and then let's do that. But if it's not true, then hey, you know, like if I'm gonna go and worship, a, you know, on heat or something like that, um, then what's the point other than hey, it makes us different from everyone else? By the way, in reality, it doesn't make us any different. When you look at all the ancient gods, they're they they're all the same. They have different names, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in, you know, if, in the, depending who you're asking and stuff like that, right? Like if the whole Ahura Mazda kind of stuff that, it, you know, Persian religious influence on Armenia, uh, if you're looking at Zeus and looking at these characters, you know, they're very extremely similar, if not the same, you, especially in the pantheon, yeah. you know, river gods, mountain gods, war gods, like these yeah. kinds of stuff. Yeah. So it doesn't yeah. really put us at any kind of a different place. You know, what does put us different is, is, is worshiping Jesus um, who conquered death by his death. I mean, you come up with another one. I, I dare you. And, uh, you know, that's going to make you different. And there are There's facts nothing like about it, people. There are facts about it. When you Amen. claim like Jesus never happened, never existed, you don't know what you are talking about. But at least we're trying to use a little shock therapy in order to let yeah. let that whole thing get out of their heads um like the, there was also a particular part that i wanted to address um like all the way throughout uh the history of armenia uh, armenia was kind of like the job story very zealous somewhat righteous but <laughs> it is it is a type of job story and uh i don't need to i don't need to tell you that what happened last year with the war and all that other type of stuff. Like I really yeah. noticed within my uh, inner circle, for instance, that their the faith that they already had was just shaken up so much. Yes. What would, as an Armenian, you would say like, if there would be a God, why would this happen to Armenia? Mm-hmm. And then the anti-Christian type of spirit would arise even more. What would you answer to that type of way of thinking? Well, first and foremost, um, I think scripture t- teaches us, and Jesus teaches us, that there are times we rejoice and there are times we mourn. Okay. The Christian is not a um, idealist in the sense where we just expect good things to happen. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Christian says, Jesus said that. Uh, blessed are you, for people will persecute you and revile you for my name's sake. So the Christian is a realist. The Christian has to be a realist. In the sense that we are not promised butterflies and rainbows and flowers, right? Like we're not promised for everything to be good. We're not necessarily promised that we're going to be healthy and wealthy. And no thing will touch us. Like that, That's not a promise we have in scripture. What we have in scripture is a very realistic view of life. Uh, read the Psalms. Uh, some people who are extremely evil will prosper and do very well. And some people who are very righteous will not. Uh, and the best picture of this is Jesus himself. The most righteous individual to ever walk the earth. Um, completely sinless. And scripture says... Uh, you know, he was considered cursed because they crucified him. Cursed is the man who hangs on the tree. And to a certain extent, he was on our behalf, but not because of his own wrongdoing. Even the, even the thieves on the cross, at least one of them recognizes this. We deserve to be here, he says, but this is an innocent man. Um, and so that's the way I approach this. But we've all mourned. We all should mourn. We have a collective mourning that should be happening. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, you know, I just expect these things not to happen. No, I expect these things to happen. I expect much worse to happen, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. Um, not just because we're Armenians. Uh, that's just the reality of existence in life. Okay? And I think that's a, the Bible presents a very real view of existence to me. Um, now, there's a theological question that comes into the picture. If, if God is, exists, if God is good, uh, why would God allow these things to happen to Armenians or to us? Because we're the first Christian nation, so on and so forth. Now, there's an underlying expectation there. Because we are Christians, because we're the first that whatever, does that somehow mean these things aren't supposed to happen to us? And that's a false assumption. It's a false expectation. Because 
before we talk about that, let's talk about people who were Christians before we were. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Armenia became a Christian nation in 301 AD. And there were Christians living in Armenia for 300 years being persecuted, by the way. Um, one, of the, one of the churches that... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. That's a pretty good one. But even before him, right? So Thaddeus and Bartholomew end up in Armenia and preach the gospel and they make disciples. One of these disciples, right, is uh, the church Dadivank is named after him. That's been a part of the conversation because of Artsakh and stuff like that. He's a first century Christian. And he was martyred for his faith, for preaching the gospel in Armenia. Um, and Jesus' disciples were believers before Armenians were ever believers. And what was their fate? Suffering, persecution, struggle, right? So that's why I'm saying it's a false assumption just to assume we were the first at something. Therefore, it's going to be good for us. Now, I'm not necessarily saying it's always going to be bad for us either. I'm just saying be a realist. Sometimes it's going to be bad. Not all Christians um, in the first, second, third century, let's say, you know, had horrible ends. Some lived to, you know, peacefully and were respected by their communities, by their families, lived to a ripe old age and died in their beds very peacefully. And that's a possibility. Uh, the assumption is what I'm going after. Um, or as if God owes us something. Sometimes people don't realize that this is the way that we're talking. God, we've done all these things for you. Therefore, you owe us. That's not the way it works. Number one, we can never repay God for what he's done for us. It's impossible. Number two, there's a very interesting story in the Bible Jesus shares. Commonly referred to as uh, the story of the prodigal son. Um, which I don't like that title, by the way. It, it should be the story of the prodigal sons. There's two sons, and both are lost in their own ways. And I think we should... Uh, I know a lot of times we go with a younger brother. Right? Sorry, mosquitoes were coming in. I had a um, window open. Go ahead, sir, brother. Yeah, the prodigal uh, sons. I know a lot, uh, a lot of times we uh, resonate with a younger brother. You know, he goes off and squanders his wealth and all that stuff but notice the words of the older brother when the older brother comes to the father he says father i have slaved for you all these years and you've never even sacrificed a sheep for me or a goatee i think he mentioned and for me and my friends and stuff and what's the father's response he says son don't you know whatever i have is yours <laughs> like you could have done that all along like you didn't need my permission but it's the mentality the son has, and it's a transactional mentality. I've served you, I've slaved for you, and I'm expecting something in return. I think a lot of times this is the view we have of God. We were the first, we've had hard time, we've slaved for you, God, so therefore you owe us something. That's not the way this works. Number one, God doesn't owe us anything. Um, to the believer or unbeliever, even more so for the believer, God doesn't owe you anything. Because God's gone out of his way. This is why we call it grace. Because it's undeserved favor. And the reality comes is that uh, not only has God saved us. He's placed us in the heavenly places with Christ. We're co-heir with Jesus. We've been given additional things. We're, we were enemies of God. Now we're children of God. We're adopted into his family. And... Um, for us to have this view as the God owes us something beyond whatever, it's just a false assumption. Um, nonetheless, I think it's normal and natural for people to expect goodness from God because he is good by nature. And so the, the conversation here about what's commonly referred to as the problem of evil comes to the surface. If God is so good, if God is all good and he is all powerful, why would God allow suffering and evil? It's only a problem if you don't think God has a purpose for allowing the suffering and evil, like a reason. Um, and all I would need to do is present a couple of possibilities that might be reasons as to why God is allowing what he's allowing. Okay, And if those are possibilities, then they can actually be the case. Okay. And human existence draws we can draw a lot of analogies from our personal lives 
where suffering is actually for our benefit, not actually for our detriment. Um, for those who work out regularly, suffer regularly, physically, it's mm -hmm. painful to work out. Um, but it's for your benefit. It might, you know, listen, we might want to drink Coca-Cola instead of water all day, every day, because, uh, you know, uh, it's pleasant. But, you know, it's very bad for us. So there's a certain kind of joy you're robbing yourself from suffering that's taking yeah. place but that, that, that's that's drinking. that's what the bible also says for if i remember correctly in hebrews 4 it says that those the, the lord loves he chastens or he disciplines and i think that that type of molding of of our culture as also made us as what we are uh, i think yeah. in, in in comparison to other ethnicities for instance armenians have very thick skin they are very passionate. You cannot run over them. So there are certain type of things that's it is had, generally had a, had a true. purpose. Yeah. So it's it's generally true that individuals and cultures who've gone through a tremendous amount of suffering are a resilient people. There's a collective kind of resilience. Um, and again, this is why I said in the beginning that I think God has a special call for us. Um there are situations and places I can get myself into, and this is a personal testimony, but I can get myself into and have conversations about Jesus that a lot of my non-Armenian friends don't want to. They kind of are afraid to offend. They're, they think it's not the place. And when I think about it and I go, okay, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm being too you know, out there. And Part of it is because I'm Armenian. Like it just boils. It's not a personality thing. It's like, no, this is like just our culture, man. When I talk to my friends, we're yelling at each other, but we love each other dearly. Um, and like the zeal that we have, and that comes into our cultural and ethnic identity. And um, and this is just true. And I, I don't want to make like Armenians up here, you know, like we're not divine, like more human or something like that. But I think this is generally true when we study cultures that are that have been through injustices, that have been through uh, just a hard time historically. You know, there's this there's this quote, um, and I might ruin it, but it says, "Difficult times uh, create uh, like people with character. Yeah. You know, people yeah. with character create peaceful times, and peaceful times create you know weak people." Mm -hmm. um, that's generally true. Okay, it's generally true. And uh, we, we've just kind of continuously been in <laughs> difficult times um, always throughout history. It's not that we haven't had peaceful times. I think we have. Uh, but I think some of that just ge geography, we found ourselves in, in, in a location where we're always at conflict with the powers that be. Armenia was always stuck between, even pre-Christian pre times, we're stuck between, you, know, you go back all the way to Assyria, you know, there's Assyria, that's the superpower, and we're right next to them. And then there's Babylon that comes and we're right next to them. Uh, and then the Romans come and then the, the Persians come and then the Romans come and we're there. The Greeks came and went, you know, then the Mongolians came and went. Then the, then the, the Turks um, came. Yeah, the Ottomans came. The and Ottomans, the, you know, the Seljuks yeah. came and, and, then, and then the Russians came, you know. The like, Sassanids came. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, this has always been the mm. case. Mm. And... Um, and it's created kind of a certain kind of culture within us. I see. I don't, I'm not saying this is inherent in us. I'm saying it's created that, because difficult times are going to create uh, that sort of thing. And generally, in in our collective psyche, this exists. But I want God to use that as an individual in me and collectively in my people for His glory. Amen. Um, I am utterly convinced this is going to sound very strange to some people. Okay. And I'm not alone in this. I am utterly convinced there's no people group that can take the gospel to the Turk the way the Armenian can. Amen. 100% okay. agree. Yeah. Utterly convinced. Uh, and I'll tell you the reasons. Number one, because of that kind of cultural thing. Number two, we have more to forgive than any other people group when it comes to the Turks. Okay. And maybe the, maybe, right. It, the Greek and the Assyrian can say a very similar statement. Absolutely. Then I would put the Greek and the Assyrian in that category and say, there's, 
the Armenian, the, the Assyrian, and the Greek are the people groups that can take the gospel to the Turks. Um, the reason is because when an Armenian says, I forgive you to a Turk, okay, even those words um, breaks so many barriers and walls. That's, that that's, if just an American, that's just unheard of. Yeah, yeah, well, I've seen it happen. <laughs> I've seen it happen, man. And, and it's, it's crazy. Um, here, uh, I'll share a story. Before I ever got involved in, in this, I, when I was in Bible college, I had uh, a, uh, a professor who was a missionary. And uh, he, he told me that he found himself in Armenia somehow. And he said he found himself in Armenia. This guy is an American that doesn't speak any Armenian. He doesn't speak any Turkish or anything like that, right? It's just, this guy knows English. And he's in Armenia. And he said, I was in a church where some Turks visited, Turkish Christians visited. And he said, they had decided to do a feet washing at this church where the Turkish believers, and these guys were like elders in their churches, washed the feet of the elders of the Armenian church, this Protestant, small, tiny Armenian Pentecostal church, and the Turkish elders, elders in their church, believing elders, decided to wash their feet. And this American guy said, there was not one dry eye in that entire room, including his own. He said, I didn't understand what they were talking about because I didn't know the language. But he said, I knew exactly what was going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I'm utterly convinced of that. And I think when we're not doing these things, and the unbeliever is not going to understand what I'm, I, I don't expect the unbelieving Armenian to understand what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Um, because I don't expect them to understand that because I, the, we, we forgive because God's forgiven us. We love because God has first loved us. Um, when you take that on yourself, then you can actually go and forgive and hopefully bring about a reconciliation. And I've sat um, with Turkish uh, brothers and sisters, and honored and worshiped the Lord together, prayed for one another. I've seen Turkish pastors um, whose grandfathers killed Armenians, blessing and repenting and praying for the children and the grandchildren of genocide survivors. And this just blows your mind because Amen. it's like no one other than Jesus can accomplish this task. Amen. Amen. Um, so we're, I think we're called, we, we're called to something very serious. Uh, and there's a, there's a reason why we ought to do that. that that's why it frustra frustrates me even more. You know, that, that we, we are like at this pinnacle moment of, we got so much resources. We have so much drive and, it's still, it's, it's just like this whole bubble of gas and it's someone needs to put a lighter on it. And just like it goes yeah. of itself. So God will do that. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you this, you know, uh, so I'm thinking about the old Testament prophets, you know, Elijah sitting there saying, God, I'm alone. I'm alone. I'm alone. You know, and then God says, no, I have a remnant. Um, I interacted. And it's really nice that you had Jacob on because he works with a good number of these people, but I interacted with young Armenians who are passionate for the Lord and feel like they have a calling from the Lord to love their neighbors in that region, right? Um, especially the ones that hate us the most. And it's like, there's no, no way uh, other than Jesus putting this kind of a love in their hearts that this could actually happen. Where they're regularly praying uh, for the neighboring countries. They're praying for Iran. They're praying for Azerbaijan. They're praying for, uh, for Turkey. They're praying for Georgia. And if anybody who's watching this is an Azuri, know that there's Christians praying for your well-being. I mean, you go and reason with that. You go and think about that. Uh, and, and I pray and hope that God convicts your heart and you come to know him. Uh, that's the reality. That's, that's our prayer. Uh, politics is good, but it is not what God can do. God employs us to listen to authority, to listen like a child listens to its father, but the only our authority that there is, is God himself. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And when the authorities are against God, then God is, uh, takes precedent over, over those authorities. God will deal with them. Like for yeah. instance, and when God I... will deal with, go ahead, brother. 
but God will deal with us as well. Everyone. Right. Like, the, the, <laughs> yes, that's the thing. Well, sometimes those statements are made in the sense of like, you know, get my enemies or something like that. And I, I, I'm not saying you're, you're doing that, by the way. But I know a lot and I've had the temptation to as, as well. And then we realize, hey, none of us stand before God without sin. We all need to repent. Everyone has fallen. Psalm 50, uh, 51 verse 5, Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20, Romans 3 to 29. For we all have fallen short for the glory of God and the wages Amen. of sin is death. So nobody escapes. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying so uh, it's like, haha, you're going to be damned. Like I'm going to be damned if I don't take his grace. That's the whole point. That's right. That's the point that you just mentioned. Like grace is where well, you don't deserve it, but you still get it. There's a different difference between mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing. Christianity, for instance, is not karma. It's not about how many good points you have against bad points. It's not about that. In a system like that, you always lose, by the way. Okay, explain. In the karmic system, you're always a loser. Uh, because it's a, it's a system that doesn't allow you to get out of it. Um, and if people are sitting there and, you know, listen, I distinguish between Western what I call like Western gurus um, and then actual Eastern gurus who, who develop this stuff. Uh, look at India and look at the caste system in India. The caste system is not a political thing. It's a religious thing, right? And why is it that people haven't gotten themselves out of, the, out of these poverty stuff for- Because they are lazy. They think, ah, next life. <laughs> No, it's not necessarily that. It's because they can't. They're not allowed to because they're being punished. And to get out of it and to try to get out of it would be to try to go against their punishment. Um, it's a very, very twisted system. Uh, let's put it this way. Suppose I'm born extremely poor. Okay. And so I go, well, why am I born poor and stuff like that? Well, the reason is because you're being punished for some crimes you committed in the previous life. Okay. What's my best way to get out of poverty in this system? Well, I'm poor. I don't have any help. I'm going to steal. Well, that's still doing wrong stuff. What's going to happen to me in the next life? Well, now I got to pay for all the theft I did in this life for trying to get out of a situation. It's a vicious cycle that is always continuously punishing you. It's always continuously punishing those who are, in, who are doing bad. And it's always continuously rewarding those who are doing good. The rich stay richer. The powerful stay powerful and the poor get poor and they stay in, in those weak positions, mm. right? It, it also kills the motivation to help those who are in need because you're interfering with their karmic punishment. Mm. Now, if people aren't convinced of this, by the way, just go look at why pe people in India were so shocked at the work that um, Mother Teresa and the sisters were doing there. Because what you're going and sitting next to someone and comforting them who's on the brink of death, like why? That's a clash of theologies. Mm. Because Jesus has taught us to love those who are the least of these. Um, and when they ask Jesus questions like, what did this man do or his parents for him to be punished like this? Jesus said, nothing. <laughs> He's not being punished because of his own sins or the sins of his father right that's not what's that's not what's going on here you know oh if the rich can't be saved who yeah, can that also goes back to the armenian type of the, the theodicy problem for like uh look at all the punishment for we, for what we have done it's the same type yeah. of stuff that the friends of job told him like the reason why all these things are happening is because you did something wrong because god is just but we all, exactly. for, for all the people who have read Job at the very last few chapters, like 36 to 30. The best part. Yeah. God is just saying, you don't have no clue what it is, to, who I am and what I do. Yeah. And, and that's ultimately what the problem of evil brings us to, where God is beyond um, in the sense that he has reasons that we don't know about. Um, and he's doing stuff that were clueless. One of my favorite passages, maybe in all of scripture, is when, Job, uh, when God confronts Job and says, brace yourself like a man, for I will question you and you will answer me. Now, this is our terrible, it's my favorite part because God's like in your face. 
Um, and it's terrifying. I'd never want God to say that to me, you know, Lord have mercy, br brace yourself like a man. You're about to be questioned by, and, and the reality is that by the end of it, Job realizes he can't answer these questions and it brings him to a humble place. Um, and, and this isn't to say, shut your eyes, shut your ears. Don't ever question anything. That's not what God is saying. What God is saying is, listen, I have more power. I have more authority. I have more knowledge than you do. I have more wisdom than you do. And the way I organize history and the way I set stuff up might not be the way that you would do it, partly because you don't have all that information. Mm -hmm. If you had all that information, you probably would set it up exactly the way God set it up. Yeah. You know what, what gave me goose, goosebumps for like um, the war that happened? When in, it was like the, the last weekend of September, the war started happening and people are getting riled up. And I remember... So two images. One image was uh, there was this uh, Armenian clerk, this Armenian pastor with this like this huge beard, and the quote that he just gave was like, uh, "The love I see in the eyes of these soldiers is more that they have for Armenia than I have for God." Mm -hmm. So like they were so they were giving up to give their lives for their country. And the other part uh, was when a, a, an Armenian cleric was baptizing the soldiers before they went into war. And I saw within my inner circle that just it just moved people. Like even the people who ne didn't necessarily believe, they didn't understand the theological implication of why it did it was that it, that it happened. And uh, so the thing that yeah, they- Yeah, um, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, finish your the, the, the thing that gave me so much hope, like in that particular war, uh, many people's faith in God diminished, but mine just quadrupled or tenfolded. So that was a very weird thing that happened to me because I knew that they were with him. It just gave me so much comfort to know that they were there. Well, that's the thing about suffering, right? Um, and it's very interesting because you'll see two people who are going through suffering. Let's just say two people have cancer. And one of them will draw extremely close to God. And one of them draws away from God. What this tells us is the situation, right? It's not a foolproof situation to do one or the other. Great point. That's a the, very great point. The yeah. individual's desire, the individual person's desire to seek God in all things, right? Is going to give an outworking, I guess, of increased faith or not. The person who's looking at the situation saying, God is in control. I trust him. I got a bunch of questions that need to be answered, but I still trust that he's in control. And I want to reason through this is in my opinion, generally going to get closer to God. The individual that has all the wrong assumptions is going to find more reasons to not trust God, not believe in God. And um, that's just generally the case. Suffering also uh, makes people ask questions that they weren't previously asking. Uh, there's a famous quote from a famous, uh, I say famous, now I forget his name, um, American general who said, there, there are no atheists in, in foxholes, foxholes being uh, trends, right? Like, uh, and he said, there, there are no atheists. And I remember in 2000, and this is around 2005, I was, uh, I was doing some campus ministry. We were preaching on a campus and some guy came to me and said, hey, brother, you know, Thank you for doing this. Now we got into a conversation and I realized we, as we were talking, um, this guy had just returned from, I think either Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and I said, how'd you become a Christian? He said, man, I, I went into the war an atheist. He said, I joined the military. I was a devout atheist. He said, after our first firefight, when bullets were flying over my head, I started to really doubt this stuff. He said, by the second one, I was really doubting this stuff. And he said, after the third one, I got baptized. Okay. <laughs> so, um, when, when, now that's his personal testimony. Yeah. But I'm assuming when you go into a situation when you're like, oh, I could die at any second you're going to ask certain questions you were not ans asking previously. And when you're staring death in the face, so it's not surprised to me that a lot of these soldiers were saying, hey, listen, 
um, we, we could die at any moment. Right. And so they start asking questions about God's existence and Jesus and, and, and all of that stuff. Now, I don't believe baptism saves anyone, by the way. That's uh, one of those issues that I have. But um, I, I think when individuals are asking these questions and they come to know Jesus, then, yeah, they better get baptized because Jesus says, believe and get baptized. Um, and so that that is what's going on. And for me, um, it's not a surprise. And it's I, I saw the same thing as you did. Some people asking questions uh and then some people uh kind of i don't want to say falling away but distancing themselves from god and finding more reasons to distance themselves from god and then i saw some people drawing so close to jesus um and where, where are we supposed to go in situations like this other than that i mean who can we turn to uh, again i'm just reminded right now when uh jesus gives this very harsh command if you want to follow after me, you must pick up your cross on a daily basis, he says, and come after me. And uh, it says that a lot of people turned and went away because they said, this is too hard of a teaching. And then Jesus turns around and tells his disciples, are you going to go as well? And Peter says, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And that's like what I come down to. It's like, okay, let's say I don't. Let's say I move away from God and Christianity. Like, where can I go? What other thing exists out there that will answer my questions and give me meaning and purpose and bring about such a worldview that is so um, well-founded and articulated than the Christian worldview? Right? There isn't any. There really is not like, and if somebody thinks there is, mm. I, I, let's I, have a conversation. I would just mention Matthew seven for seven: "Ask and thou shall receive." And if you want proof, ask for proof, and you shall have it. And there Amen. is, and the Lord has given us enough evidence. It just is proudful prelest. So you're like you just blind yourself. You just don't want to know because uh, the enemies that we have. Uh, are not a carnal, are not corporeal, are not from bodily flesh. These are spiritual enemies that you have. And the Bible teaches us that the Azeris or the Turkish, that they as people, as persons, as as people who are created in the image of God are not our problems, but the, the things or the powers at be that control them. And that's the yeah. thing that we need to break the chains off. And Jesus came to break the chains off. And that's, we need to go full force on, that's the whole red button when we click on it all the problems will be solved yeah so that's you know that's that's our main battle people are still responsible for their moral decisions by the way and they will give an answer to god sure sure um we see this for example in the prophetic works of like isaiah you know he prophesies against the nations or a side in and you know a tire and stuff like this and and um but you're completely right in saying that like it's not just a physical thing it's not just a material thing there is much more that happens. I don't know if people listen to Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson always comes back to Christianity. I love him. Okay. I, have, I pray to God that he becomes a Christian because that person, he would just like my ramp up towards Christianity. Oh, so, amen. Yeah, man. Uh, so I listen to him quite a bit and I don't think he's a Christian. But I, I want him Not to yet. Become, <laughs> yeah, I want him to become a Christian. But Jordan Peterson, for example, will talk about the Christian worldview and says the meta narrative that Christianity has, these connecting points, is beyond anything out there. No one does it. For example, Christianity answers the human predicament. The human predicament, let me quickly say this. Um, there's, there's a number of things. Uh, for example, humanity, uh, we are disconnected with ourselves. We are in conflict with ourselves as an individual person, right? So the question to ask is why? Why am I so conflicted with myself? We are conflicting with our closest people to us. We have issues with them. We're not in unity, right? So why is that the case? Why do I continuously have these internal struggles with one another? And then ultimately, humanity has a conflict with the divine. Every single religion out there tries to somehow bridge the gap between humanity and the divine. Now, without, let's put Christianity aside. Every other religion out there tries to do this by good works. Whether it's Hinduism, whether it's Buddhism, whether it's Islam, whatever it may be. Uh, whether it's atheistic communism, it's the same thing. Every single one of these tries to bridge this gap. Okay, Everybody realizes there's a gap. 
Christianity not only tells you why there is a gap between you, yourself, your friends, and God, it actually bridges it in the, in the way that nobody else can. Namely, that it's not us who bridges it, it bridge the divide because it's beyond us. It's God who does it, right? The only one that can actually solve the issue solves the issue in Christianity. And so you see this connection between Genesis 3, to say 1, 2, and 3, and Revelation 19, 20, and 21. Yeah, the, the perfect chapters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so what do you see in the book of Revelation is that there is a renewed, the earth is renewed, and it looks a lot like the Garden of Eden. Yeah, right? there's, Re there's... Revelation 20 on verse 5, I will make everything new again. Exactly. And yeah. and mm -hmm. it's it's a going back to the beginning, but actually with a solved problem. The problem exists and it's solved. And so this is what I mean when I talk about Christianity actually has the answers. Because for me, it's not like, okay, so we have people coming to know Jesus, believing in Jesus, salvation and all that. But Christianity is also a worldview. It's the filter which we look at the world in. Now, if, the, if say I have a secular worldview and the secular worldview for me assumes that the reason people are bad is because of their education. Okay. Let's just assume that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so what am I going to do to fix it? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to educate people more. So my entire emphasis is going to go into education. Let's teach people. Let's teach people. Let's teach people. Because that's what I think the problem is. But if I have a Christian worldview and I think people are naturally bad, and what needs to get, get fixed is their nature, then I'm going to address that situation completely differently. There's a famous American uh, preacher from the early 1900s. He said, if you have an uneducated thief who's stealing little nails from a railroad track, and you take this uneducated thief and you put him in school, expecting him to get more educated and not steal the, railroad, uh, the nails from the railroad track, he says, when he gets out of school, he's going to come back and steal the entire railroad. Because you've, edu mm. you've educated them to do it better. Mm. Right? It's it's not the knowledge. It's it's the it's the heart. It's the heart. It's yeah. the heart. The heart let's is never, deceptive. Yeah. Let's let's never forget that Germany, pre World War II, was probably the most advanced and educated in all areas, whether in the sciences, whether in the theology, whether in the philosophy. There's no way you can study world theology, philosophy, and science without interacting with German scholars from that time period impossible mm. in this highly advanced society came nazism came the holocaust if education solves our problems they should have been the example of it mm. they weren't because education doesn't solve the human heart it might cover it a little bit right it, it might yeah teach it how that, to be civil and stuff that, like that. that's what jordan peterson addressed many many times he told you there's being intellectually capable does not make you a good person because mm -hmm. uh, Hitler was an intelligent person, but was he a good person? So it's a matter of the heart instead of like when both are right, that's all good. But uh, as the Bible already mentions, almost everywhere is that we are fallen. We are born in yeah. sin. Uh, the, the heart is deceptive. Who can know? Jeremiah 17 verse 9. So like, we are good in the, in the sense of we are we are made in His image. So God did not yes. did not make us to make us bad. Let's get that uh, out of the way first. But it's about that reconciliation again. For like you got the first two chapters, Genesis one and two, everything is good with the world again. Then the deceptive part comes in. Yes, and that's the 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 moment when we become uh, disobedient to His word. And the whole part of the Bible is this reconciliation story again for like make everything whole again. So like, yeah. Yeah. So God, like, God has been reconciling the world to himself because yeah. the, the whole plan of God has been to create a people for his namesake. Yeah. One uh, of the church fathers, I think it was Augustine or Athanasius. I got uh, this book of Athanasius, for instance, if I'm not correct, remember correctly, he says that it's, um, uh, the son of God became son of man so that the sons of men, we shall become the sons of God. So yeah. we'll be adopted into the heir of them. So like, that's the whole premise of the Bible. If you just Bible in a nutshell, that'll be it. Amen. Amen. The, theosis. So like everyone right. who's watching, go look towards uh, his, his book. I also got this one out. 
Theosis by Vladimir uh, Karmalov. Uh, he's the uh, he's an Eastern guy. It seems like yeah. Russian. Huh? With yeah, uh, hey, yeah. I just I just interviewed Dr. Carl Moser on the subject of theosis. Awesome. If anybody's interested, go go check yeah, that out. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there the, there's there are so many layers of the Christian faith uh, that Armenians just it just just at their fingertips just. I remember, for instance, that when I went to Armenia in 2012, I was like, what, 17 years old? Mm -hmm. I went to Khorbirab. I just went to like all the all the good places in Armenia. Um, but there is this uh, internal thing that's happened over the past years, of course. And when you come back there again, it's just like a whole new experience. It's not the same anymore. And my fear is that Armenians are will decease without ever have touching those type of depths. And I'm not saying so like, oh, I found the answer, for instance, but this it does bother me in a certain type of sense to hear Armenians speak atheistic views. Mm. Uh, God forbid, I hear, even heard an Armenian girl uh, say that she was pro-choice, for instance. Uh, yeah, like an Armenian girl, for like if it was my sister. I don't need to use my words in order to explain what would happen next. Those type of stuff, so like that bothers me. Yeah, well, mm. it's it's a, it's sad, but those views permeate in Armenia itself. I mean, yeah. abortion is legal in Armenia. And past 12 weeks, uh, it's... Uh, um, so it's... it's the, Ar Armenia has female-based abortions quite a bit um yeah that's, so what, that, that's what the jacob persley for instance also mentioned he told me that there was an entire genocide spread over 50 years in your media by abortions alone yes and he was convinced that that uh, god took into account of course god takes everything into account but it, it, it dealt it did also like gave me a whole nother insight about how armenians are so yeah we we if there's anybody that should be anti-abortion if there's anybody on this planet that should be anti-abortion, it's Armenians. Um, and I would just add anybody who's gone through uh, genocide. Anyone genocide on ourselves. Yeah, so that's what I mean. Anybody who's gone through an external genocide where other people try to wipe that group out should be the most anti-abortion people on the planet. Okay, because you know what it's like. You know what it's like. You know, it's so interesting to me, and it hurts my heart, um, when, for example, one of the things that we recall from the genocide is these Ottoman uh, Turkish soldiers uh, ripping the stomachs open of these uh, pregnant Armenian women and throwing the children over cliffs. This, this is a common story that people share. And then at the same time, thinking about Armenian women walking into a hospital and having a doctor do that by their own choice, by their own will. So we ought to be adamantly against this stuff, okay? Bible says God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. Um, these are our daughters, these are our sons, right? This is, I have three kids, um, I have two boys, and uh, I would prefer, it's no secret, I would prefer that all my kids marry Armenians, for various reasons, by the way. None of them theological per se. Um, first and foremost, I prefer they marry Christians if you know they, they follow the Lord. Um, second of all, uh, I would prefer for them to marry Armenians. And um, I think about, okay, who's, who's my son going to marry if, if Armenian moms are killing their daughters? Who's my daughter going to marry if Armenian moms are killing their sons? Like, this is a very basic logical deduction you ought to do and sit there and say, well, hang on here. We shouldn't be doing this. We should be loving and cherishing. We should be having more children, <laughs> right? Like not less. I have an American friend who, uh, who has 10 kids himself and oh, have, yeah, the 10th the one's on the way. And his firstborn son's middle name is Vartan. Um, and this guy's an American, no Armenian blood. And he named his son, his, uh, his son's middle name is Vartan, named after Vartan Mamikonia, uh, because he read Armenian history. And he said, man, like this, this is the sort of people, right? 
And every time we talk about children, he says, you guys need to be producing. Armenians need to be producing more Armenians. <laughs> this is a non-Armenian telling me Armenians should be producing more Armenians, right? Like if we have the ability to, we, we ought should. to. Mm. We ought to. And it, it's very important. Yeah. There is such a seriousness in this certain type of message. Just like it just is still hard to comprehend how serious this actually is. Yeah, and you put it into the context of this war that just happened. Um, we've lost four or five thousand young men, 18, 19 year olds. Um, this stuff, then you start thinking about this stuff, right? Then you put it into context. And I don't think necessarily these things should be our reasons. I think abortion is murder and people shouldn't do it. Anybody should not do it. I'm just trying to contextualize it for our Armenian friends to say, hey, even more so, people try to kill us all, right? Mm -hmm. And part of it, I mean, what really, what, why, is there even, why is there even a conversation about abortion, by the way? Because people are having sex before marriage. They're disobeying God. And that's why there's even a conversation, that that's why there's even a need for this conversation, mm -hmm. right? Don't have sex before marriage. Get married, establish good families that will bless you, that will bless your descendants, your children. Um, going to someone like Jordan Peterson the other day, I was listening to a conversation where he was talking about how children, it just, studies overwhelmingly show that children with both parents around are healthier and better off. That, I mean, you know, way too many people are getting divorced over way too many stupid things. Yeah. That's... You know, not every reason people have is actually a good reason. No a matter vow how is a vow. It's, yeah, it's, no, ma no matter how sincere they are, by the way. Mm. Right? Um, in like thinking that's a good reason. Um, maybe there are some reasons. I mean, God allows for some reasons in scripture. Right? But, you know, I don't know. We, we didn't get along. It's too vague and doesn't mean much. And what does that mean? You didn't get along. You know, you like vanilla and he likes chocolate. Like, I don't know what that means because there is a spectrum of what it means not to get along. I don't get along with my wife quite a bit of the time, mm. uh, but I still love her and she still loves me. And when I mess up, she forgives me. And when she messes up, I forgive her. Uh, number one, we can do that partly because we're Christians, because Jesus is our, or our life's orientation is to Jesus. So if I ever feel like I don't want to forgive my wife, uh, I don't necessarily sit there and tell her, hey, I really don't want to forgive you. I go to Jesus and I say, Jesus, I really don't want to forgive her. And he says, hey, man, if you're going to be mine, this is the way you, this is what I've called you to. I say, okay, I'm going to humble myself before you, mm -hmm. Lord. Um, I have no reason to withhold forgiveness from anyone. Those who've been forgiven much, love much. Yeah, love uh, does not keep the things that are wrong. That's like right. uh first corinthians 16 if i remember correctly yeah, yeah. yeah. and love love co uh, um, covers a multitude of sins i mean mm -hmm. i mean we can go on all day about this all day but if i wanted to find reasons i could if my wife wanted to find reasons to divorce me she could i guarantee it give her six months she'll find plenty right um because we're sinners and we do all sorts of stupid stuff Mm. And but in order to result that into divorce in order to broken families like we all know i hope i hope it's for all the armenians it's clear there's an attack on the family for like from all the from all the sides like yeah. the god's ordained structure in order to the human being the individual to prosper in and of itself by his god-given laws for instance Th these things are like uh when you have like a parent who Tells a kid, don't do that, don't do this. And the kid doesn't understand it necessarily. But when he gets older, it's like, oh, that's why my parents said it. That's that right. same principle does count to us. Don't, don't negate the fact that you are a bit older, that you all of a sudden are mature. Maturity oh. is, don't mistake uh, the age with uh, how smart you are, for instance. That's all problem. I, get, I, get, I see people who are 60 years old. They're still using, uh, they're still acting as infants. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And that's the whole thing. So if it comes to Armenia for like the whole abortion thing, 
and uh, the, the whole fighting with each other thing. It just Armenia needs already has a couple of smacks on the head, but still needs to have a couple more, I think. Yeah, and and that's okay. I think God is gracious and God is kind and loving, but again, He disciplines those whom He loves, yeah. um, like you quoted, and and that's true. That's true as individuals, as as Christians. God's gonna. Uh, I mean, if I don't discipline my children, uh, man, I must really hate my children. Right, parents who say like, "Oh, I don't discipline my kids," I'm like, "You really don't like your kids. You do not care about their future." Mm-hmm. Anybody that has children realizes children need to be disciplined. I I remember that the Bible once said is that their stomachs were their gods. For instance, when you le- let people over to their um, hedonistic type of uh, needs and and things mm-hmm. like when you have a kid who wants to do that there is not a certain moment in your thought that says like nah, that's not good for him so like yeah, I mean, th- their stomachs like the inner needs are their guts but that's the whole like thing. yeah or, a, yeah. or an open grape um the if i let my my kids with eat chips for breakfast lunch and dinner right um i don't let them because it's bad for them if i let them they'll watch television 24 hours a day but I don't let them. My seven-year-old's at a point where he's reading and, you know, it's like, hey, you sit down and you read for the next two hours. And he doesn't like it sometimes. Uh, he's very unique. He enjoys reading. And I wish that, and I hope that continues. That's a great, uh, that's a great attribute to uh, have. Yeah. I hope that continues. But um, at times when he doesn't want to, it's like, no, you have to. It's good for you, right? Um, and when he's reading and he needs to get outside and get physically active, I tell him, put the book down and go outside and get physically active because it's good for you. Discipline is a good thing. Um, I think any rational individual uh, can come to this conclusion. And God loves us and disciplines us and cares for us uh, and nourishes us and, and, and is, because God wants the best for us. That's mm-hmm. the reality. And I, I can confidently say that, uh, that God wants the best for his children. And because of that, we are, we are to seek him. We are to follow after him. Mm. I can very mm. confidently say God wants my good more than I want my good. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yeah, it, I mean, it, leave, it, leave me yeah. up to me. I'm a very destructive individual. Yeah, yeah. Um. Is there an, where can people find you? I want to go back to the first question I asked you. There are certain type of uh, activities that you are involved in. Uh, last time I, I, uh, I talked with you that you are, had uh, s- sending me a link towards a YouTube cartoon, which is like explains like the uh, column as uh, our cosmological arguments or uh, articles on the website. Where can people find you? So uh, the best place is YouTube currently. I mean, do we have a website, www.apologiacenter.com. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, if you're looking for Armenian content, we have a number of Armenian content there where things are, uh, most of them are translations. I think two of them are written by a sister in Armenia who deals with apologetics, a very good friend of mine. <clears throat> and, um, uh, and then we're also working with different organizations, like I said, to work on translation stuff. For example, we translated an animated video that was originally made by um William reasonable, Lane Frick? Reasonable, yeah reasonable faith mm. uh which was the argument for god's existence from morality and we translated that entire thing into armenian um so uh, that there's links to that on the website uh that's on there uh so I, Do- dr craig international has that specific video on there we want to translate we've already had the text translated for two other videos we need to do the videos um and then um yeah my youtube stuff people can find me on instagram people can find me on facebook apologia center on facebook or just my Mm. name or just Mm. yeah i'm kind of like when it comes to the social media world i'm everywhere yeah Uh, more things to come uh, in other words god willing more things to come absolutely amen but i do sense Especially in Holland and in Belgium, that there, there are more and more Ar- Armenian apologists, for instance. Good. Weir- weirdly enough, so uh, there are we are like with uh, with a couple of Dutchies, and they say like, "Why is it that in these type of settings there are so many Armenians?" And I'm like, "That's a good thing, actually." So like, yeah. Hey, it's 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 excellent. Uh, yeah. We we need it. The more, the better. 
because every single one of us have character types, personalities, where individuals that have similar personalities and character types are going to connect with. Right. Who are all and, body of the body of the body of Christ, and everyone has his particular function. Yeah. Amen. And that's the point, right? Like I don't. If if someone has a desire to do this, whether on camera the way we're doing it or in the background if someone wants to write or something like that do it please because the the world we live in now is this is what i would say the roman roads which you know the, the statement all roads lead to rome uh that was a true statement by the way all roads led to rome rome created an extremely good road system uh which by the way a lot of christians used to take the gospel from one place to another in a safe manner, in a, in a mm -hmm. relatively safe and fast manner. Um, and we have an extremely fast manner and safe manner, right? And it's this, what we're doing right now. I mean, you're in Holland and I'm in the United States. I'm in the West Coast of the United States. And we're doing this and it's going to go on YouTube. And someone from Indonesia might watch this. Someone from Saudi Arabia might watch this. Like, mm -hmm. we don't know. Um, and so uh, put yourself out there. Let the Lord use you. Uh, serve in your local context. Like I said, you know, I serve in my local church. I have Bible studies at my house on Thursday nights. I, um, you know, I preach on Sundays. I, I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of individuals serving their local church community. Mm. That's extremely important for our, our great fellowship. But when it comes to reaching the world, reaching beyond kind of our sphere of influence uh, physically, the internet provides us an opportunity to do that. And if we're yeah. not doing it, by the way, if we're not doing it, I'll tell you who's doing it. The Mormons are doing it. The Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it. Oh. The Muslims are doing it. The, the, the Hebrew Israelites are doing it. Um, and the Trinitarians, one is Pentecostals. Like, yeah, the, the, one of the funny things is I have like uh, Edward, Edward Dalcor, uh, who is mm -hmm. like the writer of uh, this book. He's like one of the guys who is like one of the lead if it comes to the Trinitarian doctrine. Mm -hmm. He, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, he said like more anti-Trinitarians are getting better into attacking the doctrine than Christians are in defending it. That's, that's right, and that's yes. the whole thing. For like yeah. it, the, the edification part is so neglected, and yeah, Christian educate yourself any about. any doctrine, any particular parts, yeah. That's right. I mean, at least get the basics of the Christian faith down so that when you come into a conversation with people, then you're able to give at least do apologia. Yeah. Yeah. You give a defense, give a reason for the faith that you have and do it and do it with gentleness and respect. Mm -hmm. Like you don't but, have to, you don't have to go out of your way to, uh, to be unnecessarily offensive to people. The gospel yeah. is offensive enough. Yeah. But the, the first part, that's exactly true what you just mentioned. But the first part of the verse of 1 Peter 3.15 says, put uh, Jesus first in your heart as yeah, Lord. Honor, honor Christ as Lord in your hearts. Yeah. Always that, being prepared. That's the pinnacle point. First, concentrate, do not necessarily concentrate on the external word, what you're about to say. Mm. It's just more between you and the bubble that you are with your Bible and the Lord. Yeah, and, so what I would say. That would be the first thing, yeah. There's a couple of things in that verse that are very important if we break it down. One of them is honor the Christ Lord in your heart as holy, set apart, right? And then it says always be prepared. Not sometimes, always be prepared. The other thing comes with preparation is work. If someone's going to prepare to be a, a pharmacist, they got to go to school, they got to educate themselves, they got to know what they're doing. I mean, imagine if you went to a doctor and you asked the doctor, and a doctor said, I don't know, I got to open up your head and do some surgeries on your brain. And he said, are you prepared for it? And he looked at you like, eh, not really, it's my first time. Um, you probably wouldn't want him open up, opening up your head, right? Uh, it takes time. We want people who are going to impact us in serious ways to be prepared for that. And so preparation means reading, uh, right? Preparation means listening. Um, praise God, again, audio books, the YouTube, you know, there's so many ways. There's certificate programs, there is, you know, bachelor's and, uh, you know, master's programs if people are interested in that. There's like week-long intensives, month-long intensives, like there's so much content out there for us to be able yeah. to prepare ourselves. But th that's not the whole thing. It's not about that the, the attributes are out there, but it's the will in us, like Little yeah. Nest Netflix, Little Nest Bed Habits, uh, pick up a book. Pick up, listen to a good podcast when you're going to, uh, when you're going on a, on a commute to a certain place to your work or with to your family. 
listen to podcasts, like all those type of stuff. So it yeah, is, so it always uh, it always flows out of love for me, right? I, Augustine yeah. said, "We tell them because we love them." Mm. That's the reality of the Christian message. Listen, if I love my neighbor, and I'm called to as a Christian, let us give a very practical thing. Say I walk outside right now and I see my neighbor, one of my neighbors struggling with something. Let's say they're struggling to take in their groceries. And I say to them, hey, neighbor, and then walk away. That's not a very loving thing to do. Mm. If I love them, I'll approach them and say, hey, do you need some help? Let me help you carry these in. That's a very practical thing. And that involves work and effort, right? Carrying the heavy stuff inside. So if I love my neighbor and want to, I want them to tell, I want to tell them about Jesus, then I got to put in the heavy work to prepare myself to be able to tell them about Jesus. It's as simple as that. Let's not say in empty words, oh, we love people, right? I mean, James puts it in the practical sense. You know, how can you say you love your brother if who's cold and you say to them, keep warm? He says, no, give, give him something to wear. Mm -hmm. You know, if you know your brother is hungry, you tell them, be fed. That's not the loving thing to do. Feed them. And for me, it's the same exact thing when it comes to the preaching of the gospel. Um, we don't just say things like, oh, there are answers to your questions. Like, give them the answers to their questions. Of course, there are answers to their questions. But learn the answers to their questions and then answer their questions. Because that's actually what it looks like to love the person in front of you. Put in the work. Faith without works is dead. Amen. You say you believe, so what? And maybe this is true in the Armenian context um, a lot more than some other contexts. You know, virtually anyone, you can stop by any Armenian you can see or any Armenian in Armenia you can see, and even outside of Armenia, and say, hey, do you believe in God? Um, I would say 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10 would tell you, of course I do. We're Christians. We're the first Christian nation. This is the way I used to be before I actually started following Jesus. Um, and so... Do they have faith? Yeah, to a certain extent they do, but so what? Without what comes from that faith, what that actually looks like in practicality, it's useless. You know, the, the, the demons even believe that God exists and he is one, but they shudder at his name. James 2.19. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you're no different than the demons. Congratulations. You know, great accomplishment in your life. No, don't be just like the demons. Be like Jesus. That's a way better place to be. And so yeah. let's prepare ourselves um, and go in to do the, the work. Not just prepare ourselves. And there's, the, there's a negative version of that too, is where, where you just keep preparing yourself and you do nothing with it. That's useless. Prepare yourself and put it into practice. Yeah, man. Practice what you preach. Mm -hmm. And even uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, for like, thou should, who does say, uh, Lord, Lord, should not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And even when you actually sit, it's just like, for instance, when people watch you or watch me on social media, they see our pictures, they somewhat know, know what our interests are and all the type of stuff. But that's the surface level. But there's this actual deep level where when you like know the person, when you're like uh, how they are and what the way of the, th the, the way of the thinking is. That's and right, Jesus yeah. says, for instance, depart from me for your works of iniquity. I never knew you. You know him by name, but do you know him as a person? And that's the thing when it comes down to. You know, you know him by name, but yeah, even the devils know him by name. Yeah, and so, you know? so the one way we can put this is that it's very easy to know things about people. Yeah, so right? what? I mean, we, we all have individuals that we are fans of, I think, right? Like athletes or whatever like that. And we know about them, you know? Like, for example, I can maybe from the top of my head say, oh, this athlete has like two kids. Um. And, okay, that's good. You know about them. But you don't know them at all when it comes to the way that those children know their father or the way, you know, this individual's wife knows their husband or their friends. Um, and so, you know, we use words like, oh, I love that musician. It's like, no, you don't. And maybe if you got to know them, you wouldn't even want to love them. You, you like their music. You might even love their music, depending on how you want to define it. But not them, because you don't know who they are. You can know a bunch of stuff about them. It might actually be the case that if you see them, they treat you, they mistreat you. They treat you extremely poorly because they're very lousy people. Uh, just because someone has a good voice doesn't mean they're a good person. 
All right. So just because someone can kick a ball really well mm. and pass it really well, that says yeah. nothing about their character. Yeah, idolatry. Yeah. yeah, one of the two major sins. Yeah. But we also do that with Jesus, like you were saying. We know all this stuff about Jesus, right? But we don't sit down and have a conversation with Jesus. We don't let him change us. And that comes into the into our prayer life, into our meditation life, into, into those disciplines that help us draw closer to Jesus. And so there's plenty of people out there, specifically Armenians, who know a lot about Jesus. They know the religious stuff. They know about, but they don't know him. Right? And, and what Jesus is really calling us to is to know him. Uh, yesterday I preached out of John chapter 15. Um, and, and he says, abide in me and let me abide in you. And he said, essentially, dwell in my love, right? So that your joy may be full. Right? Like, so these are promises Jesus gives us. And we have access to that. It's, if someone's just content on knowing about Jesus, it's, that's not what Jesus wants from you. Jesus wants you to be in a relationship with him. He wants you to know who he is. But how would you answer that? How can you know Jesus? Well, there's very practical things. Now, listen, all knowledge starts in the propositional sense, essentially, right? Uh, all of this stuff starts from the about. About knowledge is surface level knowledge. It's, it's good, you know. Uh, if someone says, hey, do you know Arthur? And you say, oh, you know, the, the one with the beard that has a YouTube channel, you know, that's about stuff. And they say, yeah. Um, and then you go into other ways of figuring out who I am beyond that, maybe having a conversation with me and asking me specific questions. Um, and I would say God has revealed himself in scripture uh, in that kind of a sense. So we have both about knowledge about God. Um, God as a trinity is an about knowledge about God. It's, it's an important one, but it's an about knowledge, right? Um, but things like Jesus loves me, and has communicated that he loves me uh, in the general sense and in the specific sense. In the general sense, he's communicated that he loves me in the word. But it could be a case that, you know, in prayer that morning, he reassured you in your heart, in your feelings, in your emotion. Maybe it was a thought you had that he loves you. That would go. So let me just break it down. Uh, these are very practical ways we can know Jesus in that way. First and foremost, reading scripture prayer okay prayer is just conversations with god by the way if you don't know scripture you're gonna have a hard time praying by the way because you don't know what to pray about you don't know the about knowledge in order so your prayer life should always be an outworking of your scriptural life um i personally enjoy praying at the end of my devotional time after i've read scripture mm -hmm. um it, it gives me more stuff to pray for and about um Fellowship, Christian community. What kind of Christian community do you have? Uh, because if we actually function like a Christian community, which is to encourage one another onto righteousness and godliness and holiness and into a better relationship with Jesus, then you're going to know Jesus better because you have people encouraging you in that sense, okay? Strengthening you in that. Um, so Christian community, I would say evangelism. Um, if, if you, why evangelism? Because evangelism will force you to pray for people you've never prayed for before. Um, and in praying for them, God